and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal, and we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Benjamin Frederick de Campos, a designer and believer, and Jeffrey Jonathan Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. Jeff? Hello. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, which is what we're doing right now, and publish the notes, which are available to read along on our website, eclecticist.co.uk. And we do this to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is racism. Discussing race is never easy. It's quite possibly the most divisive topic of our current era. A fair-skinned person of European descent needs a lot of caveats before discussing anything pertaining to the lives and cultures of people of a different ethnic persuasion, and had better acknowledge his or her privilege and apologize sincerely and profusely for his or hers part in the exploitation of all non-white races since time immemorial. Otherwise, this person is a racist. So this is a tricky one. Um, it's probably maybe the most divisive thing we could actually talk about. I mean, two white men, as you and I are, talking about race, it's probably like two men talking about feminism. Our opinions just simply aren't valid. We, we aren't qualified to really speak with any authority about what other people might be putting up with, particularly people of a different ethnic persuasion. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think we are qualified in that we are humans and that we have had experience on the planet. Uh, I think it's a topic everybody should be talking about and everybody can talk about. And uh, it is certainly divisive, as you say, uh, but I think it's factually based. And I think we should start with the definition of what racism is, because it's not... It's not easy to understand. It's not obvious what racism is. I think it's misconstrued often. It's based on the word race. Racism from the Oxford English Dictionary, which again is free if you hold a library card in the UK. Um, racism is defined as a belief that one's own racial or ethnic group is superior or that other such groups represent a threat to one's cultural identity racial integrity, or economic well-being. A belief that the members of different racial or ethnic groups possess specific characteristics, abilities, or qualities which can be compared and evaluated. Hence, prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against people or other racial or ethnic groups, or more widely of other nationalities, especially based on such beliefs. So that's the principal definition of racism in the Oxford English Dictionary, and I think it's quite confusing. I don't think that really settles the matter in terms of what it actually means. Therefore, I think racism is, uh, it can be interpreted in different ways. I think it's contextual. So it depends what you, what dimension of racism you, you want to speak about in any particular time. I think it's tricky. It's slippery right from the, uh, the very beginning. Well, we can talk about what racism means currently today, what people talk about when they say racism. It's obviously, this is quite a hot topic right now, um, and I can't repeat enough that it's divisive. And you're simply wrong saying we're qualified to talk about it because we're humans, because people just don't see it that way. I mean, technically, you're right, for sure. Yeah, I, I think from that definition and from what I generally sort of understand by it, is that, I mean, I originally thought that it meant to adversely discriminate against somebody for something that they couldn't possibly control. So if you're born with a particular attribute, to denigrate that person because of that a attribute is sort of a racist thing to do. Because, you know, what can they do about it? That's not necessarily race, though. That's 
prejudice. You can discriminate against someone who has freckles, say. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's what this definition from the dictionary is basically saying. It's saying it doesn't necessarily, it's not just skin color, for instance. It's any kind of ethnic or cultural grouping. It's, it's a group of people that could be, um, it could be geographically based. It could be physiologically based, but it is a, a group of a definable group of people. That is to say, a group of people who differ in a way that they can be classified. Um, so, for instance, you know, you can't have good without evil because if it weren't for evil, you wouldn't be able to define good. What? what <laughs> you couldn't have a definition, basically. So racism is basically difference, and it's the discrimination, usually an adverse discrimination uh, against a particular feature set well just to um bring up something just to put it to one side is this current idiocy that i've heard um from various people and one quite uh, high profile instance of some student speaking up uh who was a person of color who was claiming that only white people can be racist and a person of color cannot be racist and she had a bunch of dumb logic as to why that was the case which sounds completely ridiculous, but then I've heard a few other people say something equally stupid as that. So what was all the dumb logic? I mean, how was that justified? It's to do with um, just a backlog of uh, exploitation, colonialism, oppression, all that kind of stuff. Somehow that worked for her. Uh, okay, but I, I, I get the, you know, I, I suppose you could always formulate a set of histories in order to give your argument against an oppressive classification of people more weight. But immediately speaking, what would a racist transaction consist of? So forgetting about history, if you had two people or two groups of people, what could you say would be a racist transaction? I mean, what actually is it? So forget about all the historical baggage. If one person taunts somebody else because of their skin color, is is that racism? So let's say a green person is talking to a blue person and basically saying, look, you know, I, I need this task done, but uh, there aren't any other green people here. And I don't really want to give this task to you being a blue person because you'll probably screw it up. That sounds like a racist transaction. If you don't consider the, the historical baggage, just in that melee. I, that's a very distracting example. Why don't you just say a black person and a white person? Well, no, I'm, say, I'm saying a green person and a blue person. To make a point here, the, the point is, is that I don't want to put either color on either side. No, it doesn't make any sense because... Why are they? Why is one green? Why are they, why is one blue? Is it because they painted themselves, or is it because that's how they were born? Well, that that's that's my point. My point here is just a purely logical point. I'm I'm anonymizing the races, and I'm wiping out any sort of historical cause of prejudice. So it is a green person. It is a blue person. The green person seems to be disparaging the blue person. Is that racism? That is my question. Because if it is racism, then you can easily swap the colors around or put any colors there. So what I'm getting at is that you can't possibly only have racism in one direction, like these people were seeming to insinuate or outright saying earlier. Oh, I completely agree. But the people who make that argument do it from this idea or notion that white people have historically been the oppressors, and so somehow that means their arguments are invalid. But, but when you when you say historically the oppressors, well, what history are you talking about, and when are you talking about, and how 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 was that oppression meted out? Because by by numerically speaking, the the most oppressive peoples and groups of peoples around the planet historically we're, we're not white people per se okay well let's talk about this then 
So statistically speaking, I mean, if you actually look at the numbers, um, obviously you get white people killing white people, brown kill- people killing brown people. You know, everybody kills everybody throughout history. It has always happened this way. You've had... Um, and when I say white people and brown people, really, I'm honestly saying green people and blue people, you know, whatever the different colors are or whatever you perceive, the fact is there have never been one peoples that you could define by any criteria, um, to to be always oppressed and never the oppressor. You know, it's always, people have invaded everywhere and, you know, it's all checks and balances and perspectives and it's very tricky nobody is always the oppressor the the way you're framing this is just very confusing to me because it's it's not an even playing field um you can't say like blue and green as if these things don't matter because everything is just so charged with just the history of white people calling the shots for forever but but that's not true but well that's not true (laughs) <laughs> that's that's simply not true. You only have to look at the the uh, Islamic Empire and how they called the shots for an enormous amount of time. Okay, that's that's fine. But I, I said somewhere in the show notes that uh, you and I, obviously, we are Westerners and we're speaking from a Western perspective. And we are all too aware that non-white Westerners have quite often been under the boot of the white man. Well, I think what I'm trying to say is I'm first of all, I want to establish what we're talking about and what the what the the definitions are and what ac- racism actually is. So you opened with somebody saying that racism only happens in one direction. Right. The point I'm trying to make is that that is not true. And that that fundamentally cannot be true. Oh, I completely agree. If you erase all of the cultural baggage. But then if you bring in history and, you know, you can have a very low opinion of a particular group of people because of the perceived injustices that they had carried out historically. So, of course, that charges the situation. Um, and, And we're getting on to that now. But racism is simply a disparagement of a people's or a person because of their ethnic grouping or their physiological grouping or their geographical grouping. So my original feeling was that it was simply to be born in a way in which you can't help. But I think it's it's larger than that. And you can be you can be racially accosted for reasons other than your skin color or or you know the the religion you follow i think it's a much larger term and it's a bit blurrier around the edges sure okay well let's uh, let's get into it should we just go through this systematically sure human human diversity i mean uh you know there are a lot of people on the planet and they are geographically grouped together for enormous amounts of time and that gives rise to specific features for different humans and different habitats so we all know this so people who uh have spent you know a large amount of time in very hot countries like australia versus people who have spent very large amounts of time in very northerly cold habitats like the arctic look different <laughs> i mean they, they really do look different and from from the perspective of people who do not belong in their groups they look quite similar so there are you know a high level of homogeneity in the inuits in the arctic and there's a a similarly high homogeneity as perceived by other groups of aborigines in australia you know they look very similar in their groups and they look very dissimilar between the groups so this is a basis for racial evaluation people look different you may not like the way they look you may fear the way they look 
you may like the way they look. Uh, but definitely people having spent a very long time in different habitats will tend to look significantly different, not different in terms of the species. You know, we're all so amazingly close together as humans. It's hardly any difference at all, genetically speaking, but there are differences and we're very attuned to these differences because we're very attuned to what humans look like and what we look like. So definitely different people look different. So this I think could very well form the the basis for you know racial um, transactions and, and general um, consideration between different people. You know, the first thing you see when you meet somebody is you see that person, <laughs> usually visually, if you're not blind, and you can instantly classify. You know, we're designed to seek patterns were designed, I think, for in-group preference. So, you know, we generally, as a rule, prefer our own. And when we think of our own, we think of people who we immediately compare with ourselves and our kin. Uh, so somebody who looks substantially different from our own small, close group, we'll consider them a little bit differently, perhaps. And it might be, you know, in, in historically in our interests, to be a little bit more cautious with people who look substantially different from the group that you're used to. Uh, so there is variation between humans. There have always been variation between humans, and only relatively recently have we had a, a high degree of integration when you've had people who have spent generations and generations and generations all around the world coming together and living in the same cities and, you know, these super societal structures that we've built relatively recently. So diversity, I think diversity is important to remember. I mean, we certainly are not all the same in, in, you know, in every way. Uh, we're different people. Uh, I was reading that uh, the most ethnically diverse country in the world is Uganda. And the five top diverse countries in the world are all African and the least ethnically diverse and genetically diverse is uh, Japan and Korea. They're very, you know, the group is very similar there. So um, I think it's important just to, uh, to recognize this fact of human diversity. That is a fact. We are not all the same. And it's not just physiological. It's also um, uh, intellectual. You know, you can have uh, an Ashkenazi Jew who uh, are the, I suppose you could say race, but the group of people who seem to do the best in sort of high level IQ tests. And then you have people like the Australian Aborigines who, who fare terribly in IQ tests. And they generally have, you know, IQ, a general sort of IQ value that is, uh, you know, 20 or 30 points lower than the uh, the Ashkenazi Jews. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, there's a couple of things there. The thing about the Ugandas being the most diverse, I think is just confusing and technically true, I'm sure, but it's just not what anyone here in the West or maybe even the world would consider to be diverse because they're all black. So, I mean, how diverse is that? So, you know, a typical person here in the West would not see Uganda as being diverse and would definitely think that any city in the West would be far more diverse by having an actual spectrum of, of skin tones. But but there is a spectrum of skin tones in Uganda. No, I, I looked this up. <laughs> there really isn't. Well, not to your eyes, perhaps, but there, there certainly are lots of different shades just because they don't go all the way to very pale faces. But honestly, it's, it is very diverse, both ethnically, culturally, and genetically. It would be not diverse in any form you'd fill out in the West to describe your ethnicity, because you'd have white in one category, and then you'd have various other shades. And then I'm pretty sure there's not, well, there's probably maybe two or three for black, maybe black African, black Caribbean, but I don't know. I, I, might, I might be totally wrong, but... No, I, it's just I think you're right. It's, it's how we in the West perceive these these differences. Technically, 
they, they really are diverse. But I understand what you're saying. It's the argument that, you know, unless you're identifiably European white, then you're black. <laughs> so there, there are a million different shades of, of black, uh, as there are a million different shades of white. But there definitely is a sort of uh, a threshold there, which is which is quite high on the white side. So I mean that's a peculiar one. That's just social perception. It's like a mix, mixed mixed you know people who are mixed race between white Europeans and African ancestry black. Um, that sort of mixed race I think are considered black. It, it seems odd to me. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know. well, it's it's non-white. So interestingly enough, just on a side note on that, here in the United States, they use the term biracial, whereas in the UK they say multi-race or mixed race. Bio or biracial. So, anyway, <laughs> bioracial, no biracial, as in two. Right. Even if there are others in there somewhere, it's, but anyway. Um, so, but the other thing which I want to flag uh, or plant a flag to use Sam Harris's well, bi- language. Biracial. So sorry, sorry to interrupt here, but. Biracial could be that doesn't tell you much. You you then need to then I suppose tick more boxes to say what those races are. So do you get a chance to tick two boxes I suppose in whatever it is whatever form you're talking about here? I don't know. I'm not sure. I just heard there's a comedy duo called Key and Peel who are very funny and they just describe themselves as biracial. I'm biracial. I'm biracial. And um, they didn't feel the need to explain that. And so I assume that that. That's the term they use here. So mixed race. Yeah, but what does that help. mean? Does that mean that they're they're half Malaysian and half, you know, uh, uh, sub-Saharan African, or does it mean they're half Inuit and half um, Indigenous American person? I mean, it tells you nothing. Yeah, it it uh, well, it tells you something, but you'd have to ask them for like the granular details. But to describe yourself as biracial, that's to say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't clue anybody in, unless they're standing in front of them, I suppose. Basically, biracial means not white. Right, That's exactly. That's kind of what yeah. they're well, saying. There you go. So, but the other thing, uh, which I want to flag up there, and you, you've kind of stumbled into, not stumbled into, but you very seamlessly went into an area which is the most divisive, where I've heard a few people, including Sam Harris, talk about this area. And it's essentially an an actual no-go area. So, very smart people won't go where you went, which is to suggest that certain races are different in terms of their intelligence and that any investigation into any avenue about whether or not this particular racial group is smarter than this particular racial group is so unethical as to be just radioactive to your professional career or your reputation or all of those things. And it's just something that we just don't do. I don't understand why it's a problem to believe there are differences in general intelligence when we know and agree that there are differences in every other physiological dimension why should why should the brain be any different of, of course the brains are different an aborigine in australia is going to have all of the mental faculties he requires in order to survive in that particular environment likewise anyone else it's about the environment it's evolution so I think certainly humans have different capacities to to learn and to comprehend uh, what that difference is, what, what the range is, maybe very tiny, maybe negligible, and we shouldn't even be talking about it. But I think to say that there is no difference, I, I don't even believe anybody says that, but to say that there is no difference, I think is sounds ridiculous to me. Okay, Jeff. So you, you say you don't see why anyone would not go there no i i do see why people it don't sounded go like there. you i thought you said you don't see why but, but i but if you were to honestly think about it and if you are to concede that there are differences in every other dimension which there are then it's bizarre for anybody to maintain you know that not only that it is is it a no-go area but that it's it's not something worth thinking about or yeah, I, I think it's peculiar. Do you remember um, one of the guys who discovered DNA? Is it Crick? Um, no, it was Watson. I know who you mean. No, but one, but one of them 
in recent times, as in within the last 10 years or something, if you see, I don't know, they both might be dead now, I'm not sure. But one of them kind of was ostracized for talking about deficiencies in certain ethnicities, mental deficiencies. Do you remember this? Yes, I remember. And I think he it got to a point where he was so embargoed that he had to sell his Nobel Prize really? in order to pay for his retirement because of comments along the lines of, I think he was interviewed about the prospects for Africa, and he said that the prospects are grim. And I, and I think he had a conversation about general intelligence, and, uh, and he was rubbished and ostracized, as have been quite a few other scientists in this particular area. I mean, it doesn't go... The ha- research has been conducted, and uh, it is an area of interest. It's just a, a major taboo to suggest that an entire, I suppose, race or mm. grouping of people uh, scores... Well, I mean, the, 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 the scoring is a fact. I mean, they conduct... Uh, IQ tests, which again, you know, you could say arguments have been made that IQ tests are biased in particular ways and are not um, indicative of general intelligence at all, and that it's it's bunk. But lots of correlations have been made between IQ tests and um, general uh, socioeconomic class, and you know, a lot of a lot of studies have been made. Um. And I don't know. I think that there could be a a racist element in considering these studies. You know, people could say, you know, this is racism. Uh, But if it is racism, it would be, I suppose it would be racism against Ashkenazi Jews who always come on top all the time. (laughs) So I wouldn't say it's white people per se. It's probably either the Jews or the Asians who score the highest. Uh, you know, and then it's white European white people, and then it's sort of, uh, I suppose, in the American context, then it would be Hispanics, uh, and then then it's blacks, or or as Americans uh, call black people, most they seemingly call all, all black people in America seem to be classified as African Americans, which which boggles my mind because I think, oh my God, it, I would be offended if anybody ever called me. Uh, an African American, uh, I would immediately say I'm an American. Well, where are you getting the African from? I mean, in this country, the UK, I couldn't imagine somebody being, being called an African Brit. You know, <laughs> meet my friend. He's an African Brit. What the hell? That's crazy. He's British. So that's just weird. Well, this is the, this is the stupid thing. So I um, knew a British person uh, who was a person of color. Again, person of color is a is a terrible absolutely but it's terrible. also i've i have known people of color who have found that offensive term people of color person of color but this person of color was from the uk um and he was called uh, an african-american here in the united states it's like no i'm neither of those two things <laughs> and it's just peculiar honestly i just i just simply don't understand what's going on but of course if we're talking about about America, America, the melting pot, has you know many, 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 many cultures, and certainly many, 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 many supposed races. Again, I'm uncomfortable with the word race. You know, I when I was a kid, I always thought correctly that there is the human race, and that's about it. That's interesting because that's uh, what uh, Ken Ham says. Really, who's Ken Ham? He, oh, he's a, a creationist or something. You know exactly who he is, Jeff. Ken Ham's a creationist. <laughs> he is the creationist. Right. I don't know much about Ken Ham. I haven't watched much of his stuff. I know his name. That's about it. Refer to podcast number such and such when we discussed creationism. <laughs> he is the mm-hmm. man behind the uh, Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. Oh, right. The Ark. They're actually building a, a real Ark. They're not building. Amazing. It's built. It's open. It's done. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I have to read up on that. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yes. Only one race. Yeah, only one race. So you know, everybody's so obsessed about this race thing. And obviously I've been watching the news and it seems to be really spilling over in the United States. 
but it, it doesn't stop in every other country as well, you know, especially in the Middle East. Uh, I think that's, you know, racism, the real hot point on, on, on racism is certainly happening between all the different religious sects of Islam and all the different cultural differences uh, between the people in the regions uh, far more murderously than it is in the United States on a much, much greater scale. Uh, but again, America being America, it's much more visible. You know, it's more saturated in the media and it has just better coverage all around. So, of course, I've been very interested in the recent seeming spate of police killings um, whereby the black community, again, terrible, terrible words and terms all the time we're bombarded with. Why? Black What's community? The problem? What does black community mean? A community is, you know, I know that guy over there. I know that woman over there. I go to that church. You know, a community is people you know, you know, very close to where you live. Not the whole country. But you don't say, you don't define a community by anything other than people who live closely together. That's a community. You know, you can't have a worldwide community. That's completely ridiculous. You know, look at this, look at this, look at this community of stars. Uh, no. What, what term would you use, Jeff? Well, I wouldn't say anything about community. I'd say um, there's a movement, perhaps. Um, I, I think I would frame everything completely differently as I'm seeing it, seeing it, um, the, the media uh, contextualizing everything. But what has happened as a Brit and what I'm seeing in the United States is that there are a lot of racial tensions and the racial tensions seem to be between what the media classify as African Americans and white people. I think it's just generally white people. So, and by white people, I think the media means white European people. And the problem seems to be that the, the African Americans are disproportionately targeted by the law enforcement community, as they say, and that there's a far higher rate of incarceration for black people in the United States than anyone else. And the reason for this is because they are unfairly corralled by the police. I think that's the problem, or, or that's the perceived problem. It's, it's really difficult for me, uh, but that's what I think the issue is. So when there is a policeman who kills a black person, that's major uproar and, you know, big news on the media, you know, really runs away with it. It's a real huge story. But we don't hear anything about anybody else being killed by the police, particularly not in the UK. So when white people are killed by police, which I think they are killed by police more than anybody else, num numerically, um, we don't hear anything about that at all in the UK. We only hear about the killing of African Americans. It's a crazy game of skew because um, out of all of this, I didn't know that the police kill that many people every goddamn day. <laughs> it's like three people on average a day here in the United States are killed by police. And sure enough, it's only when there's a kind of a racial element do does it kind of get spun to the media. Um, it's not always necessarily white people killing black cops. It's like, for example, a, a very famous one. The name escapes me. Is it Ferguson? Oh, yeah, the Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Yeah, that's it. Well done. Yeah, Trayvon. That's it. So let me just... So it was George Zimmerman uh, who shot Trayvon Martin. And Zimmerman, he's, uh, I think he's Cuban, half Cuban, I think. He, oh, it says here, mixed race Hispanic man on, on Wikipedia. So it's not necessarily uh, white people, but it's definitely black people getting getting shot. And so we hear about it. It's spun in, in the media because of the racial elements, but also it's spun in different ways as well. And again, this is a sort of touchy subject, but there are some, well, many of these incidents are justified in the officer using lethal force on 
you know, some assailant because uh, they're fearing for their lives. And I think Sam Harris made this point that there are definitely some instances of actual racism where a black person was murdered. But a lot of these, and I think, for example, the, that might not have been the Trayvon Martin, but one of them was in, in the news, in the media, they kept showing photographs of like when this particular black individual was, um, was a young child and looking all innocent and all this other stuff, you know, not how they were at the time when they'd kind of gone off the rails and were enjoying a life of crime. Maybe not enjoying. Well, it's spin for sure. I mean, the media is the media and they love any kind of controversy or celebrity or sensationalism. So it's inevitable that they'll spin certain things. But I think it's disingenuous um, when you falsely depict the uh, the the unfortunate um, victims of violence uh, in the way that they have. Um, Michael Brown, I think, he was... I think the killing of Michael Brown, this was the Ferguson um, incident when uh, a white police officer, I think he was having, I think Michael Brown was wrestling the police officer for his gun and then was killed. And, uh, and prior to this event, I think Michael Brown was stealing from a shop or, or hassling a shopkeeper in some way. And, you know, obviously that's no reason to be killed. <laughs> but even so, I think a lot of the details here are, are left out in the initial press releases and the, the initial media runs. But typically, from what I can see, is that the people who unfortunately die in these incidents with the police they all have a, a criminal record you know and they all have a, a sort of a bit of a dodgy background that's not to say that's any kind of justification for their killing but it 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 doesn't look as, to me as though they're being targeted and being you know deliberately killed by the police uh but it's tricky there's another argument about the percentage of the black community involved in crime is uh, not commensurate with the actual population itself. So cops probably quite naturally recoil or react in a certain way to an African American assailant than they would, or a, an unsub than they would anyone else, because it's more likely that they are some kind of crime git. That's a kind of no go radioactive area that is similar to any tests to find differences in intelligence of different racial groups. And so cops need to be just as fair sizing up any any race of potential criminal, etc. You, you know where I'm going with that. But the, but there are, you know, there are facts and the facts are that you can look at different rates of criminal activity in different communities, whatever those communities might be, or whatever classification of people you're talking about, there's going to be um, different statistics. Uh, but I think the problem, where there could be problems, could be when you're considering data that is unfairly biased in the first place. So what I mean by that is you could see for instance, the, the statistics on a particular individual who is an African-American versus a Asian-American. And you can look at how many times those individuals have been stopped by the police. So it may be 10 times for the African-American, say, just plucking, plucking that number out of the air, and no times for the Asian-American. And you may think, well, you know, obviously the Asian American is less inclined to crime because of that statistic. But it could be that the black, the, the African American is equally as disinclined to crime as the Asian, but just by dint of the fact that he's black is stopped more. And that could be because of the, you know, these perceived statistics from the cops to suggest well no, not perceived actual statistics that you know more american 
uh, African Americans are committing more crime in a particular area. So it's a it's a vicious cycle. You know, you can't escape from it. So that you know, therein lies the frustration when you think, you know, I I am a law abiding citizen, and yet I'm constantly being stopped by the cops because it just so happens in this area that you know people of the same skin color as me seem to be committing all the crime or maybe that even isn't the case and yet because you're black you're being stopped because of maybe a national statistic that seems to uh, to suggest that so i think there certainly is a case to suggest that darker skinned people especially again i don't like this word but i'm going to keep saying it african americans are unfairly uh treated and this leads to uh, uh, a skew in the statistics uh, by law enforcement. And uh, and it does seem like a vicious cycle. And I think there are a lot of other factors like um, welfare and the availability of social welfare, um, you know, doesn't necessarily help uh, more impoverished communities. Uh, so there's a wider sort of political argument to suggest that uh, the this, this, this status quo is is not in the favor of particular peoples. But, you know, individually speaking, I think it's important to recognize what racism is and how damaging it can be and that it can be in any direction. Uh, And institutionally, I think it's important to be aware of racism. So institutional racism being a sort of biased consideration of racial features baked into policy actual actually part of the rules uh and again we must absolutely recognize that because most people i think would agree that that's not where we want to be we don't want um jim crow coming back uh to the united states and you know having all of these segregation laws again you know that would be terrible so integration i think is important uh isolation is a bad thing um and recognizing uh when injustices are when there's a potential for injustices and uh so i think generally speaking most western countries seem to be making progress in these areas and i mean i personally never see any kind of racism you know certainly not conspicuous acts of racism that i can recognize you know if there is racism that's going on i i'm, I'm honestly not noticing it well, here's the thing, white boy. You are white, and you have been enjoying white privilege all your life. You just don't even know the kind of stuff that goes on around you. Now, I had a very heated conversation with someone where I just simply had to acquiesce because my opinion was invalid, speaking as a white person. So I was making the point, and this is to a person of color, a, per- a quite privileged person of color who had a lot of... Um, wonderful benefits that only a rich family and good circumstances can afford you. And she was incensed that I suggested that me, as an American boy, put up with more grief in my British school than she would have done. Because if you are a person of color and someone is being overtly racist towards you, authority will discipline that person and make an example of that person because it looks bad on everyone. But if you're nasty to someone who's an American, good. A white American? Yeah, great. Go for it. So I suggested that that's the case. And then this person was like, no, Ben, you just don't understand that racism towards a non-white in a, non- in a white culture like in the United Kingdom is just completely invisible to people like you and me. Now, there might be some truth to this, I think it's possible that without even realizing it, certain institutions that are predominantly staffed and run by white people could be slightly uh, selective against people of color. I don't know. But apparently it it happens all around us. And I occasionally, when I get chummy with someone with a non-white, I ask, you know, have you ever noticed anything like this? And it all depends on where they're from. Like, for example, there is a gentleman on the radio who, uh, just yesterday, who, his name is Floyd something. He was the animator from, who worked for Disney, an African-American man. He's like 81. And um, he grew up in Santa Barbara. 
in a really nice neighborhood in Santa Barbara. And he said, I've never been the victim of any kind of racial prejudice whatsoever. I went to Disney and I was successful, yada, yada, yada. And I think that's atypical because most black people will say, even if you know they're from a moderate kind of background, they will say, well, I, I had a terrible time, thanks. And yep, there was this one time where someone did say something nasty to me or I didn't get this promotion. And I think it's because I'm black, you know, this kind of thing. So you have white privilege. You wouldn't know. Well, yes, I think um, certainly we have entered an age of so-called identity politics. And, uh, you know, you generally fall back on all of your supposed vulnerabilities and use them as weapons against other people uh, to either shut them up or or to um, achieve parity as you see it. But, I mean, certainly racism in the schoolyard or, you know, skin color racism I've seen, I've witnessed in my life, and it's a horrible, awful thing. Uh, and it certainly affects uh, the victims who are who are singled out for this, who are generally a minority, you know, living in the West. Um, if you are dark-skinned, you are a minority. Uh, and I think it's, if you weren't a minority, then maybe that it would be different. I guess I suppose it's a power struggle and it's also a perceived injustice or disenfranchisement uh, that also fuels the the, the victimhood of uh, racial claims. Um, you know, it does seem as though uh, when you look objectively on the West, it seems as though that it is old white men who run all the biggest institutions and wield all the power. Um Increasingly not the case, I think, statistically increasingly not the case. And, uh, you know, America has had a non-white president. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're limited in your aspirations uh, universally. I mean, certainly it can happen. Uh, you do get non-white CEOs and uh, general people of power. So, uh, but is it because they have had to overcome greater challenges? I mean, you know, it's... It, it's it's and I can see how it's annoying for white people when they are marginalized or they are um, compromised. I mean, we had uh, the I say we you Americans had affirmative action, uh, which seemed on the face of it quite unfair. It was a, a sort of a, an idea that it was sort of recompense or some kind of uh, restitution uh, but it was imposed on people who had nothing to do with <laughs> ah, but, yeah, the I'm crimes trying, but, of the past no but this is interesting about affirmative action because i'm pretty sure affirmative action just uh, not under that name it is prevalent in the uk i think the bbc is probably a good example of that um they, they have a quota and i'm sure they will overlook um a white man um or a white person to get uh, some kind of, some type of minority in there because, man, that looks good for the BBC. So that's discrimination. Yeah, I think organizations are very open about this. And I think, wow, if, if we, if there, you know, if you turned it around, it would be, there would be blood in the streets. Like, like Apple, Apple, I was listening to um, uh, an interview with some senior Apple executive, Apple computer, and he was talking about diversity in the workplace at Apple, because Apple has always been historically very white indeed, and certainly almost completely male. And they're trying to overturn this, and they're trying to increase their diversity quotient. So they're trying to hire more women. Um, and they were saying, you know, the, the, the balance between men and women in the upper echelon uh, of the executive suite is still, you know, 75% men and 25% women. And it's not, it's not good. You know, it's not good. But we're working on it. You know, we're really working on it. I'm thinking, well... well there you go. <laughs> surely it's, you know, that that's how it is. And, you know, we're trying to make our, our, our escalation process more meritocratic. And, you know, if more women appear, uh, well, then that's great. Uh, but, you know, our processes are no longer biased towards a particular gender or a particular you know, perceived race 
Uh, we just want ability. It's about ability, not about we need to get more women in, you know, regardless. <laughs> we, we will hire the women even though they're not as competent as the men that we're currently interviewing, you know. Hire the best person. If mm. all the best people are green people, well then, you know, Stop that. the issue That's is somewhere stupid. else. Okay, why a couple of things stupid? there. Why is that <laughs> stupid? <laughs> no, it's stupid when you say green people. Yeah, but why? Because well, there well, are no the green reason, people. The reason why, I'm, but, um, because I, Jeff, I'm Jeff, no, deliberately, no, no. don't try and shut me down. I'm going to shut you down. The reason why, the reason why I'm saying green people is for an obvious reason. It is forget about all the existing attributes that you can possibly target or discriminate against. Make one up because it is simply a placeholder for any particular attribute you want to use. It doesn't work. In the same way, it doesn't work when you said if the tables were turned, there would be blood in the streets because it's not an even field. It's just like white is just so low it's so base everything else is better than white so you can't say oh green and blue or whatever as if any color is the same as each other that's that's exactly precisely what i'm not saying well i don't i am not i am yeah clearly i'm not saying that colors are equitable in any way all i why say blue and green because (laughs) jesus okay i'm going to explain this to you the point i'm trying to make is Discrimination against anything, whatever it is, is unfair in and of itself, and it it is criminal in intent. It's not fair to discriminate against something that cannot be helped. So when Apple say, you know, we just we need to tick more boxes and get more people in, they're they're doing that for whatever that color or attribute is it doesn't matter because it's perceived as underrepresented whatever it is <laughs> so whether it's good or bad or it, it's irrelevant it's just that it's underrepresented and we need to get the numbers up and we we need to get whatever this underrepresented minority is i just in. i understand all of that okay but i just don't understand why you keep saying blue and green in in the stead of saying anything else so I don't. So I don't confuse the issue by saying by choosing something like Hispanic. So you're saying blue and green to not confuse the issue. I'm not going to mention blue and green again. <laughs> All right. Please continue. Gosh, what's wrong with you, Jeff? Why are you so prickly? Okay. I um, wasn't prickly. You were prickly. No, you're. You being kept weird. shutting me up. You I'm just kept sh- shutting me up. Listen back. Listen back to it all. You're the horrible, awful arsehole who keeps insulting me and shutting me down, as usual. It's you. You're the problem. And it's ridiculous you. You like that you say, I'm, I'm the one. Just, just listen again. Simply listen again and then honestly tell me who's being an arsehole. I'm simply making these, uh, trying to build this analogy, and you're basically saying... Rubbish. Garbage. You're dumb. That's a stupid analogy. That doesn't make sense. You're stumbling into something. You're always negative. Negative, negative, negative. You're totally the negative one. Just listen to it. Listen to it back. And you just have all of these microaggressions against me that constantly go on about throughout the entire conversation. Okay. Yes. Right. So j- th- this is kind of fun because um, this is a conversation like having a conversation with someone who's just permanently like on the edge of something. So like speaking about race with, with a person of color and because I'm a white person, it's like everywhere is just booby traps. It's like if I say something, oh man, I'm going to get it. So nope, I'm going to ease off of that. And I, I've had this. I've had this conversation. And it's like any conversation um, that might be even remotely controversial, as I said at the very start of this podcast... There's so many caveats to make sure I don't trigger any kind of reaction here so we can kind of like get things moving a little bit. So that was, you know, quite a good uh, example of of that. But that wasn't what I was going to say. What I was going to say was victim culture. And that's the one thing that I think I find just irritating. It's the same thing with this new wave of feminism. It's like there's a group of people who are so delicate and so fragile 
you can't speak openly about these things because they're going to be damaged or something, or there's going to be heat in a kind of way that's totally non-productive. I have heard people of color take issue with you know Black Lives Matter and all this kind of stuff because they don't want to appear as just being victims. You know, if they pull themselves up by their bootstraps, they want to be recognized for doing that. You know, in the face of adversity, not to have all of these leg ups and unfair advantages and affirmative action and all that kinds of things. You know, we don't want your charity. But the people who are the um, the angry brigade say, no, you don't understand. Whether you realize it or not, you are being oppressed. You know, even if you say you're not, yes, you are. And I think that is actually quite a destructive thing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, th- a lot of people out there are being disenabled by people who believe they're serving some sort of just war on their behalf and are effectively saying, it's not you, it's the way you're being treated and you need to get more from someone else in order to get to uh, that level playing field. Um, As opposed to, you know, everybody needs to look inward and work out exactly what their own problems are and then maybe they'll have more accountability, which will be more motivating for them in order to, you know, get to the to the same place, but by personal means. I think this whole victimhood thing and the social justice warrior um movement that seems to be going on where you know the absolute worst possible thing you can do to somebody is to offend them uh because they'll be you know damaged by it and uh they'll need their safe spaces and hug rooms and all the rest of it uh it sounds uh, a, a real retrograde step in the development of everyone uh it's not progress and uh i think it's a real problem And uh, I heard on the radio yesterday where someone, name slips my mind, but they said that their university came out with a statement saying, we accept students who, we're not going to try and protect our students from dangerous ideas or to have conversations that, you know, are difficult and take an effort to try and crack open and make progress through uh, because we're a university and that's what we're for. (laughs) And we want to, we want to um, encourage uh, discussions uh, wherever they might lead. And I thought, Mm. Hey, that's great. That's exactly what you want to hear because that's exactly what institutions of thought and learning should be for. And the idea that we're all going to silo ourselves and, you know, everybody's just simply not allowed to talk about certain subjects because mm. it it may uh, trample the toes and sensibilities of a particular group. Uh, I mean, it's really terrible. And I think the freedom of speech is important. I think um, integrity in thought, in public thought, uh, is important. And I think the truth is important. And uh, I think once you start trying to shield people from facts because it might hurt their feelings, uh, then we're on the road to hell. Okay. This is um, something which I put into the notes, which uh, dovetails nicely with this. I kind of used to be actually colorblind. (laughs) You know, it's like, whatever. We're all the same. It was only until I had things pointed out to me that's, oh, I see. We actually do need to build walls between us because... uh, you know, we can't get along. Oh, silly me. So I put this little thing into the show notes, this little social bum flakes section, where calling people racists. So if you're discussing race, and if you might use some facts that sit uncomfortably with certain people, you know, this social justice warrior movement or the white knights or whatever, you could be called racist. And, you know, that, as Sam Harris has said, you know, that's like raising the bogeyman of racism. It's like, oh, my God, what have you done now? So it's obviously devaluing and debasing the word racist because obviously, you know, racism exists and there are people who are actually victims of race, of racism. And to be called racist because you're just curious 
or you might have an opposing view, but you're you're not just sort of being racist. <laughs> you're actually kind of using actual facts or just just curiosity. And so there are people who call people racist. And a good example of this is when Ben Affleck called Sam Harris and Bill Maher racists. Well, as in he said what they were saying was racist. It's gross and racist. And this has now become a relatively famous meme or an infamous meme on the internet. That's gross. That's racist. And it's just you're just shutting someone down. It's like, I don't like the sound of what you guys are talking about. I think this is racist. And because obviously Ben Affleck is a well-known an actor who obviously has a lot of people saying he's wonderful and he's worth a lot of money, he's a bankable star, then, you know, he's not used to, or he doesn't need to listen to the nuance of what people are talking about. And so I think people like Ben Affleck and a lot of people who shut people down by calling them racist, they do it for reasons which are scoring points with people of color or scoring points with people who want to score points with people of color. And uh, we can talk about what I believe points to be. Points or votes? Mm, points or votes, but also it's like you're shinning. I've, I've written here, because I couldn't think of a better way to put it. It's a special points are special crampons for shinning up the self-serving greasy pole to reach a fat overflowing bag with shiny gold coins hewn from pure political correctness and sparkling sanctimony shaped diamonds. That's the best I could do. Yeah, I think uh, certainly people don't want to be seen to be a racist. I think... Uh Anything is better than that. The worst possible thing that can happen to you is for you to be perceived as a racist in modern society, I think. And however you can possibly worm your way away from any collusion with racist-leaning thought uh, is, is a course of action you'll take. Especially if you're in the public eye, it would seem. You absolutely wouldn't even court a conversation about anything close to <laughs> difficult when it comes when it comes to race, which is kind of understandable. I mean, nobody wants to uh, nobody really wants to publicly draw a caricature of Muhammad uh, when they know the repercussions are going to be all bad. But I, in that, it's a dangerous thing to do. You don't want to speak about anything that could possibly be perceived as racist in a similar way that you wouldn't want to draw a caricature of Muhammad because it would be just as dangerous for you, right? There are dangerous repercussions for doing that. You're destroying your reputation. You know, you're, you're, you're physically having to worry about your personal security. Um, because it is such a hot topic. Uh, but I think the media here could really help out by having better dialogue moderators, you know, people who are able to say, look, you realize you've just called that person a racist. Now, how exactly are you going to justify that? You know, given given how loaded this term is and how how you know dangerous it is to wield, uh, if used, it should be challenged. You know, precisely why is it that you have just called this person a racist? So more 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 public accountability meted by the media, I think, is important. So I think the media should be held to account for a lot of this. Uh, you know, they suck at this and uh, they, they rally to anybody who calls anybody else a racist. Uh, you're calling that person a racist. Therefore, we're on your side. And tell us a little bit more about why they're a racist. But don't. But we're with you. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's but don't. And it's then that person is a racist. It's like, why is he a racist? Yeah, racist. So it, 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 you're it's racist for a asking very, that question. Term, and I think it's, it's stirring up. I mean, the media, again, this is what they do. They like to stir things up. And they're they're dangerously stirring things up. I mean, we have the Black Lives Matter movement, which you know you could argue is fomenting um, racial tensions and uh, and violence. Um, you know, some of the things that some of the the events that have unfolded since their. Um, their founding, which I think was during the Ferguson event, the police killing where Michael Brown was, I think he was, I, I remember reading that he was, he was said to have been executed, sort of, uh, you know, murdered execution style and that he had his hands in the air and he was saying, don't shoot. Um, and none of that was true. <laughs> and yet the Black Lives Matter um, movement 
you know, didn't, didn't falter. It, it continued and then just absorbed all the, the, uh, subsequent police shootings. Uh, and it's just, it's getting bigger and bigger and now it's multinational and you're having sit in protests in other cities around the world at police violence and, uh, you know, targeting against, against, I suppose black people. I don't know what black people means in terms of black lives matter. I don't know if it's just African Americans or if it's any non white people. Uh, so it's a bit muddy there, but it seems to suggest that, you know, the, uh, police, police forces are institutionally racist perhaps. And then there's, there's an effect that has come out of this called the Ferguson effect. I don't know if you've heard this, but the Ferguson effect is where police will simply not intervene they, they they will not involve themselves in areas that they perceive to be trouble areas or you know predominantly black areas and then and so crime is on the increase because of this because the police don't want to get involved because it's too dangerous for them you know they'll lose their jobs lose their lives lose their reputation and they just can't be bothered uh there's nothing in it you know it's just just no reason to go near certain areas and when you have quite segregated cities as there are in america then this is a real problem because then you know obviously the gangs and it, 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 it starts spiraling out of control so bad news all around unfortunately another uh problematic little byproduct of all of this is um just not being able to correct anyone in very trivial little things it's like there's a guy i used to work with uh he's a person of color and he, he wrote this facebook post um, talking about his thoughts on Black Lives Matter, and I think he thought he was being very profound. And oh, it sorry, was a, broke a face Facebook post. I mean, he made a Facebook post. I don't understand. I don't understand. Broke. Oh, he wrote. Yes. I beg your pardon. I thought you said broke. There must have been a little glitch in the microphone there. Yeah. So he wrote this Facebook post, and um, I think he thought he was being very profound. Maybe he'd been drinking or something. But, but because he's a black person writing this, it's just hmm, yeah, great words, and. <laughs> One line of it goes, I believe black lives matter. I, one day, all lives will matter. <laughs> so it's like currently, currently black lives matter, but all lives don't matter. But maybe one day all lives will matter. Uh, but it's like it's not a case where I could say, hey, um, that kind of didn't make any sense. It's just a kind of, oh, yeah, yeah. Way to go, man. Yeah. Weird. I don't know how it's all going to end, if it will end, but... uh I think it's a problem. I think it's important for the government of every country to recognize these sorts of movements and this sort of impasse that you can have with uh, taboo subjects like this. But it certainly seems to be getting out of proportion in the United States. And I think Black Lives Matter, just I don't see the good in it particularly. Um, and I, I see a lot of potential problems with it, especially politically. It seems as though Hillary Clinton seems to be aligning herself with Black Lives Matter quite a bit. I think that's a bit of a worry considering, you know, they're quite violent in their outlook and quite binary in, in their political persuasion. Anyway, I think certainly equality where equality, you know, the, the, the intent of quality, equality is important. You know, you must want a fundamental um, equitable outlook for society, whether or not the result is as equitable is a different matter. I think, you know, if, if, if going back to the beginning of the conversation, if, uh, you know, you have a job and all the people who are applying for the job are of a particular criteria, you have to think, well, you know, I can, I can only work with what I have here. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to sort of hire the people who are the best people for the job. The best swimmers are going to tend to be longer in the body, shorter in the legs. You know, um, the best runners are going to be longer legs, shorter bodies. Uh, basketball players are going to tend to have longer arms than they are tall, which apparently is true of the NBA. You know, it's evolution. You adapt to your environment. And uh, if everybody's different, well, then there will be different abilities. And I think either you recognize that fact or you continue down the road that everybody is the same. 
uh, not just with the same rights, but everybody's actually the same, and then constantly try and tip the balances in order to even everything out. And I think if you do that, then you're halfway down the road to communism, and uh, I think that'll be a terrible idea for everybody. So I think it'll be interesting what happens when uh, November comes around for Americans. Um, I think there's a lot more we could say on this. We could really delve into the statistics um, and, and go through quite a few historical moments which may or may not have led to the racial perceived racial tensions in several of the Western European countries. But I think this is more of a, just the way we feel about this particular topic and uh, and how we see it from our slightly different perspectives. Me being perceived as a white albeit slightly American-sounding English person in the UK, and you being perceived as a... How would you say you're being perceived? A bit bit Hispanic? Well, yeah, I I have a little bit of street cred because I am uh, biracial. I'm a white Hispanic. So um, when I need to be white, I'm white. (laughs) When I I need to be biracial, I'm biracial. But there is something else I want to just touch on really quickly. This is the last part, and that's uh, white guilt. Do you feel any white guilt, white man? Guilt over what? Is this like the uh, I should feel guilty for Adam and uh, his partaking of the fruit of the forbidden tree kind of guilt? Or is this guilt from what I personally have done? Any way you want to answer that. I, I don't feel guilty being white. No, I don't feel guilty. Okay. So I do feel occasional little twinges of a certain privilege and white guilt you could probably say i kind of feel like an extra layer of confidence which might be to do with being a white man it's like you know obviously i'm a contractor i'm a freelancer and i see a lot of people who tend to work in menial jobs here in los angeles and they are all pretty much predominantly hispanic men and women and i don't know what it is about me that never thinks uh well if i screw this up I'm going to be like these guys. And what's that all about? So I feel, cert- I feel guilty about not being fearful that my life could be derailed, which it could be, you know, and I have to do some of the menial tasks that these people don't look like they're having much fun doing, you know, whether you did just the, the bottom rung kind of stuff. And I wonder how this happened. And I can't help but think, well, I wonder if I just had an easy ride of things because I'm a honky. Uh, maybe, maybe that's true. Um, you you don't ever get that? No. Really? Yeah. You, so you feel it's your due? No, not at all. I, I don't. It, I don't see what there is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not really. I don't really understand what there is to consider. What do you mean? Well, you say sometimes you feel guilty because things could go a lot worse for you, and somehow you don't countenance this possibility much. Um, I don't feel that way. I've never thought that. Uh, and I don't feel I have any, anything is my due. Um, that, I don't see how that's related to <laughs> any kind of guilt at all. I don't know. No, it's just, okay, maybe I'm just explaining it wrong. It's just kind of, you and I will probably have a certain expectation of comfort in life. And why is that? I don't have that expectation. Like you, I think, yeah, everything could go south. I think I, I probably have a lot of anxiety about the fact that everything could go really badly wrongly. I mean, certainly don't have an expectation. Who the hell knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Hmm, okay. But it's in, ter- in terms of race, I don't, I don't think in terms of race at all. I don't ever think, I don't think of myself racially. I think of myself as me. I don't think of myself as me, the white person. <laughs> I, really? I don't even factor, factor in race uh, when I'm considering things particularly. I never did. I never did. But I mean, there are other little things which I, we could have spoken about early on in the podcast when we were talking about racial um, characteristics and things like this. It's like f- there are reasons just that you could just like factual little points which seem like there could be some resentment here. Like, for example, if you take an average white person, 
And there's a lot of variation in that person. You know, that person can have green eyes, can have blue eyes, can have you know, different types of fair skin, freckles, different hair colors, and all this kind of stuff. And the darker the race, you know, the, the less variation there is in that way, you know. So black persons will typically have black or very dark colored hair, brown eyes. And what kind of resentment comes out of that? It's like, oh, look at that hunky. He could just, you know, just gets up in the morning and doesn't need to do much to that person, to his hair or her hair and just out the door looking like that. You know, those beautiful radiant green eyes and all this other stuff. And I can't help even little things like that harbor resentment. And somehow I feel kind of like guilty that oh, here I am being the white dude with, um, with, with these kind of burdens. I don't quite entirely follow you there. Um, right. In terms of diversity, again, there's a lot more diversity in non-white humans than there is in white humans. I mean, you get radical differences. I mean, if you're talking about eye color, well, there are, you know, genetically speaking, you have the sort of blue alleles uh, and you have the brown alleles, but the, the variation within the brown is much wider than the variation within the blue range. Um, I, 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 you know, you know, black people, I guess when you think of African Americans, you sort of think of, you know, North African black ancestry but you know there are you know the, the different there's massive differences between east black and west african black types uh you know enormous differences throughout the entire world of non-white skinned people uh you know there is an awful lot of diversity i think perhaps in the west here we don't see that that much we don't we don't realize there's that much that much difference but there really there actually is Jeff, here in the United States and also in London, it's you have this air of superiority. <laughs> for that's not true, but so you have the white people who could just come in all different flavors, but then you have the other races. And here in the United States, just as I remember in London, it's like ninety nine point nine percent will have brown hair, will have the same kind of brown eyes. Um, you could say that for a lot of different races, but I just, I'm just saying this is one little background component to fuel some kind of resentment and maybe some white guilt on the other side. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. So, oh, so you think um, non-white people resent white people for being white physiologically? That they, they would, they themselves would rather be white than anything else. No, I'm not saying they would rather be white. I'm just saying um, it's like having a car with more optional extras. So you can have the basic model, which is just you're stuck with these types of, uh, that type of stereo, that type of thing. <laughs> but it's like, or you could have this other model, which has all, you can have it in 10,000 different shades. And you've got a, you know, really wonderful radio or a really boring radio, whatever you want. It's just that. It's just, oh, fine, whatever. But also, I have heard noises about... Um, Someone I know, a person of color who has straightened her hair and has to like spend all this time in the morning getting her hair to look a certain way. And she's essentially trying to make her hair look like, uh, like a Caucasian person's, you know, long flowing, you know, plenty of weight body, you fling it around, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just saying it's an understandable little um, potential element of uh, resentment that I'm cognizant of. Well, people are different. And I think that might go away one day, but at the moment, uh, they physiologically just simply are different. So I think the job we all have is to try and get along a little bit better. And I certainly think being open and honest about this sort of thing is the way ahead. And I think there could well be some disturbing truths out there for, for all of us uh, that we're just going to have to try and get through. Um, so, you know, break down all the taboos, let's have an open and honest conversation. Let's try and, you know, tamp down political correctness a little bit and, uh, and let's just point the finger at the problems and, and maybe they'll, maybe we can work on trying to make them go away. Unless there's anything else, um, we don't know what we're talking about next time, but if you have any suggestions or any other feedback, please visit 
our webpage. It's eclecticist.co.uk, spelled as it sounds. There's a feedback form at the bottom. There's information on all of our previous shows and links to the notes and also the MP3 files. Most of the shows are also on YouTube, which is just basically for the audio and a few slides, but we'll try and make that a little bit more interesting going forward. Um, As I say, any suggestions for next time, please send them along. And until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, and good evening. Oh,